June 1915. Under the guidance of South African John Lee, 400 African laborers are hacking a highway through the unbroken rainforest. 150 miles of manual labor in the tropical heat. Lee's bush road leads across jungles, through swamps and over mountains to the Great Lakes of Africa. Tanganyika, Victoria, Nyasa. Two already are in British hands, but Tanganyika is the jewel of the German Empire. A prize that London desperately needs to turn the tide of the African War. 420 miles in length, it is a vital lifeline needed to arm and supply a jungle army. Whoever controls the lake controls the surrounding territories. One man rules her waters. Capitan Gustav Zimmer of the Imperial German Navy commands a powerful marine unit of 150 men. His fleet of three heavily armed gunboats has obliterated the puny armada of the Belgian Congo. To win the battle for Central Africa, Zimmer's navy must be defeated. Yet for the job of destroying him, the Royal Navy selects a former military surveyor who has never led a brigade into battle. Lieutenant Commander Jeffrey Basil Spicer Simpson is an old Africa hand who has spent the first year of the war behind a desk in London. I'd gladly take charge of the expedition, sir. I had four years in Gambia, sir, and I have extensive knowledge of small river craft. All right, Simpson. Then it's chance, disgusting. not choice, gives him an opportunity for greatness. Why did we go to Tanganyika? Because the Germans, with four ships on the lake, were commanding the lake. And by means of these steamers, were able to supply their troops on the frontiers with provisions and munitions. It was important that this should be stopped. Spicer's orders are almost surreal. London wants him to tote his own toy navy from England to Central Africa. A pair of 40-foot motorboats to be dismantled and freighted to Cape Town. Then tugged overland by steam tractor to the Congo, a trek of over 9,000 miles. with Zimmer's gunships waiting at the other end. Spicer assembles the team. Well, gentlemen, here is our route. We'll Former architect of the Rhodesian Railway, Paddy Wainwright, is the chief engineer. And our friends, the Germans. Tropical disease specialist, Dr. Hother Hanschel, will be the medical officer. As a casual friend of Spicer's, Dr. Hanschel knows Spicer is not your average leader. Spicer Simpson was a vain man, worthy of ridicule and on occasion great admiration at the same time. This paradox was only possible because of the very nature of Spicer Simpson's own behavior, which was quite often bizarre. Twenty-eight men will make the journey. They are gunners, mechanics and engineers. Not one has ever served under Spicer. The plan to take Tanganyika from the Germans is a simple one. Get to Tanganyika and destroy the German fleet by stealth and surprise. But their own warships are converted supply boats. The two boats taken to Africa by the expedition were not at all suitable as they were. But they were the only ones obtainable at the time. My orders were to get away at once.
Spicer gives his mahogany warships names befitting pleasure boats. HMS Mimi and Tutu are quick, top speed 20 miles per hour. Spicer tests them on the Thames and has a three pound Hotchkiss gun mounted in the fore and a 303 Maxim in the rear. June 15, 1915, stage one. The Naval Africa Expedition leaves England on a 6,100 mile voyage for the Cape Colony. While Spicer and his men enjoy a placid southbound cruise, John Lee's army of African tribesmen hacks its way north. By early July at Cape Town in British South Africa, the caravan transfers from ship to train. July 19, 1915. Stage two. The entire expedition consisting of men, boats, and hundreds of boxes of supplies are moved north by rail. At Fungarumi in the Belgian Congo, they will meet up with Lee. Two thousand seven hundred miles of European built railways pierce the heart of a colonized continent. After two weeks, Spicer and his men reach the village of Fungarumi as expected. Morale is high. But then, just as his expedition is about to begin its overland odyssey, I'm sorry, I have to inform Spicer fires the man who blazed the trail. You will become a breach to the security of the expedition. That is completely false and completely wrong. To return to Cape Town, report to the Lords of Admiral. He dismisses John Lee and offers no explanation to his men. Do that, you dumb angels of Bluxem. He alone will lead his men across the burning plains into a jungle few Europeans have crossed since the days of Stanley and Livingston. Engineer Wainwright orders them stripped of all fittings. Propellers dismounted the axles of the carrying wagons reinforced to carry the eight and a half ton loads. While final preparations are being made, a critical member of the team arrives by a rather odd means. Ex-policeman Arthur Dudley has pedaled 200 miles over jungle trails to reach the expedition. His role, to organize and lead the African laborers transporting the supplies. Dudley was Royal Navy Reserve. He'd served in the Boer War. Now he was fooling about in Rhodesia doing transport work. But he was capable. Just the sort of fellow for that. Just enough sea knowledge and just enough military training to manage well.
Two months after leaving London, Spicer's Navy on Wheels is joined by the steam engines that will pull the boats through the forest. The tractors are built for level country furrows, but ahead of them lie some of Africa's most forbidding peaks. But this strange caravan is being shadowed by Zimmer's African spies. We knew that the English intended to challenge our supremacy of the lake. We also knew that the Belgians were building a boat. Where they were building or wanted to build was unknown. If Spicer and his men make it to Lake Tanganyika, Zimmer vows they will not leave Africa alive. August 18, 1915. Stage 3. 150 miles of some of the least forgiving terrain on Earth await the British troopers. A wild land of disease and sudden death. At first light, Jeffrey Spicer leads his men out of camp. There were no roads such as we call roads in this country. And except for about 25 miles, the whole route ran through thick African forest. dry season will last only a few more weeks. Then the autumn rains will come. If mud swallows the tractors, Spicer's mission and his only shot at glory will be over before it begins. The steam tractors are in the lead. each hauling one of Spicer's little ships and 10 tons of wood for the insatiable engines. 400 Africans, men and women, carry water, food, ammunition, medicine. A procession that stretches for nearly two miles. On the first day at the first river crossing, Mimi and her tractor nearly tumble into the current. It is the first test of Spicer's leadership. Undaunted, Spicer has Chief Engineer Wainwright come up with a plan. Wainwright has more trees cut, reinforces the bridge, and the convoy plods forward. The work was completed at 2.30 p.m. and the trailers were towed across and a start was made along the road at 3. Good progress was made along the road and at 6 p.m. a camp was formed for the night. Spicer knows there are more than 140 rivers and gorges still to cross. The path they are following continues uphill for 60 miles. Then they reach the Matumba Mountains a 6,400-foot range. Day by day, mile by mile, the former desk officer grows more confident, his boasts more outrageous. The men love him. He appealed immensely to the ratings. They all appreciate a commanding officer who's a bit mad, eccentric. 
and he was obviously mad. Therefore, he was marvelous. Wild animals, boys. That's the worry. No idea what it's like until you faced a man-eating cat. That, that worry. I'd say he could not refrain from telling absurd stories about his prowess at shooting the lions he'd shot. Although I'd never heard of any lions in Gambia. The caravan survives on the skill of his African hunters, living off wild buck and guinea fowl. As for water, Hanshell and a team of Africans find the nearest water source. Much of the water is for the steam tractors. The rest is filtered, boiled, then filtered twice more, and used for tea, cooking, and the next day's water rations. The steam engines are insatiable consumers of water and firewood. Advanced parties prepare storage caches of lumber. The journey through the bush was divided up into three 50-mile stages. At the end of each stage was built a depot to keep the sun off the provisions and ammunition. The Englishmen, many of them new to Africa, fear lions and crocodiles. But Dr. Hanshaw's duty is keeping the men healthy in a region plagued by unseen killers. One very valuable thing was the paymaster. He began to get some boils on his shoulders, and out of the boils popped worms, big maggots rather. The men all saw this, I showed it, and I said, Now see, here you are going through a country where the danger is from insects. Not from wild animals, but insects. You see what they can do. From the spies, crude telegraph lines convey fragments of news to Capitan Zimmer. He believes that Spicer has come to help the Belgians build new warships at Lake Tanganyika. Around Lukuga and south of there by Calame, there seemed to be only defensive building going on. But about Mimi and Tutu, Zimmer knows nothing. While the confident Germans wait, the English plod on, one agonizing mile at a time. Three and a quarter miles was the average for the boats. Occasionally we did rather more, and on one occasion we covered 14 and three quarter miles. But there were many days when we were lucky if we did a mile and a half. One day we did only three quarters of a mile. By late August, Spicer knows he needs help if he is to outrun the rains. At a village called Mwenda Makosi, the British commandeer 42 oxen to help drag the boats up the Matumba range. When the rains begin, they will turn the plains into a quagmire, too shallow for ships, too muddy for wheels. A 
Until then, heat is the deadliest enemy. The thirst for water is unquenchable. Water for the engines, water for the oxen, a few cupfuls a day for the men. Then, in early September, a sudden storm of fire. Spicer has his men create a fire break. Looks like we've got a bush fire, man! Right, Peters, get to it! You know the drill! He then orders that his precious mahogany boats be protected from flying embers. For Dr. Hanshaw, it is a day of sheer terror. We nearly lost the whole thing by fire. Here was this war train bearing down on us at a terrific rate. We'd burnt off. We set fire to it, only just in time. Just in time, we moved the guns, the wagons, and everything onto the burnt place, and the thing stopped. It was so damn near it came. In the weeks that follow, the oxen prove their worth. The top of the plateau was reached on September the 8th, 1915, and this was a very triumphant moment for the expedition, for there were some who had said it was impossible to get there. Our difficulties were by no means at an end, for on the downward trek from this point to Sanchesia, there was some risky work to be done in lowering the boats down the sharp spurs of the mountain. They are still weeks away from the combat zone. Using 42 oxen, two road locomotives, and hundreds of men, the expedition struggles to get down the mountain. On more than one occasion, the wheels of the boats dropped into ant bales. The only way to get out was to fill up the hole with logs, gradually jacking the boat up until it reached the level. It was only by good luck that they received no damage. There is a great deal of thunder, and it appears that the rains are not far away. The journey now has become a race to get to the railway before the rains break, and the roads become impassable. Finally, the land is level, but the dangers remain deadly. This is the country of the Tetsi fly, carrier of the sleeping sickness that kills both men and beasts. Villages are nearly deserted, the ghost towns of Central Africa. No rain falls. This is a dreadful blessing. Drought scorches the plains. At one point, the traction engines came to a standstill for want of water, and the members of the expedition were getting only half a pint a day. Lieutenant Commander Spicer offers local women a bolt of colored cloth if they will trek eight miles to the nearest well. Hundreds accept the bargain, and the convoy moves on. For the first time since he tested them on the Thames, Geoffrey Spicer's two-boat flotilla reaches water deep enough to sail upon. Mimi and Tutu are reassembled and lowered into the Lualaba River.
October 1, 1915. Stage four. They will float or drag their boats 200 miles downstream. Strange apparitions to the resident wildlife. Progress on the river was very slow. I think Mimi and Tutu hold the record for grounding. As on October 7th, they were aground 14 times in 12 miles. Even on water, Spicer's flotilla manages barely 10 miles a day. Then at the rail depot at Caballo, Mimi and Tutu must be packaged safely for another journey by rail. October 22, 1915. Stage 5. The final phase of the long odyssey. 173 miles across precarious trestles and crumbling bridges to the Belgian shores of Lake Tanganyika. Spicer's rivals are already preparing their reception. Gustav Zimmer has followed every mile of Spicer's incredible trek, still unaware of the unlikely cargo. The effort to find out more about the area around Lukuga and Kalame was resumed in earnest. They took down a lot of telegraph wires and blew up telegraph stations. As soon as the British reach their final destination, he will send his gunboats to destroy Jeffrey Spicer and his half-mad dreams. October 28, 1915. After four months and over 9,000 miles of travel, the unlikely odyssey of Lieutenant Commander Jeffrey Spicer reaches the blue heart of Africa, Lake Tanganyika. Finally, he has reached his battleground. At Calame, on the western shoreline, a defensive network of guns, troop quarters, and shipbuilding facilities guards the back door of the Belgian Congo. For their British allies, the Belgians have prepared simple dwellings. Spicer claims the largest to be his headquarters and hoists the banner of the Royal Navy, an emblem of his growing lust for power. Gentlemen! Calame has guns, but no harbor. Well, I'm sorry. Not possible. To protect his boats from the Germans, Spicer insists the Belgians construct a harbor. I need to launch my ships very quickly. Once in the water, they need to be protected. The decision to build the port was come to owing to the facts that it's impossible to operate without a defended port. And the existing defenses at Kalimi will amply protect the port selected. Hundreds of tons of rock are blasted and positioned into the crocodile-infested waters to create an arced jetty. Atop the rocks, train tracks and a launching slip or lane, which will allow Spicer to slide his miniature navy into the lake in minutes. While the jetty is taking shape, the Belgians give Spicer the details of the three German ships he must destroy. The smallest German vessel is the Kingani. At 55 feet long and 12 feet wide, she is far larger and better armed than Mimi or Tutu. Her compatriot, the Hedwig von Wiesmann, is even larger, but slower. Carrying two powerful guns and a crew of 22 sailors, 
she has room for 200 extra troops. The Graf von Gotzen dwarfs them all. An 800-ton monster, she is over 20 times the size of the British speedboats. Her massive guns can blast Spicer's boats to oblivion with one shell. The little British boats are seriously outmanned, outgunned, and outsized. To tilt the balance of power, Spicer plots a surprise attack to capture the Kingani. It is an audacious plan for a desk officer who has never led a combat mission. Our only choice is an ambush. Sometimes the Germans anchor themselves here at the Valu Island. Perhaps what we lack in size, we gain in speed. Ambush is our only choice. Thank you, Jen. Across the lake, Gustav Zimmer plans his own strategy of strength. We learned from intercepted Belgian telegram communications that they were looking for a building location. As soon as it was practical, the reconnaissance work began. December 1, 1915. German lieutenants Walter Rosenthal and Job Odebrecht embark on a stealthy mission of reconnaissance. In four successive evenings, the two ships slip in under darkness, snapping off night exposures of the harbor. The next evening, Lieutenant Rosenthal risks his life in a daring solo mission. He wanted to swim ashore to find out more about the dry dock and the building of the new ship. Despite the danger of crashing waves and crocodiles, he reached the dry dock, took notice of two boats, then swam back to the designated meeting place. But a panicky German officer orders the Kingani to leave without him. Rosenthal is forced to hide out on the Allied side of the lake. At daybreak, abandoned in enemy waters, Rosenthal is taken prisoner. Zimmer is still ignorant of Spicer's jungle navy. Mid-December, the rains come. Work is impossible. All they can do is wait. We're having heavy rains almost daily, and one or two members of the expedition on average are always down with slight attacks of fever. On December 23, Spicer decides it is time to go to war. Far from his desk in London, Africa has freed Spicer's spirit. His battle dress reflects his liberation. To the amazement of the crew, and to the Belgians and the natives, he didn't wear shorts. He wore a little, tiny little khaki skirt with pleats in it. Spicer and Britain need allies. 
The men of the Baholo Holo nation see the eccentric white man as a natural chief. Christmas Eve. The mahogany gunboats undergo their first trial runs on African waters. On Christmas Day, we took a rest. And it being the first time the whole expedition had been together, we had a big celebration. December 26, 1915. The Germans come to fight. Spicer is reading prayers when an enemy ship is sighted. Spicer ignores the enemy's approach. He alone will decide when his private war will commence. I finished prayers and then sent the hands off to get ready. Chief Petty Officer, prepare the launches for immediate action. Stop. Division! Dawn helmet! <laughs> Dr. Hanshaw and other non-combatants head to the cliffs to watch the battle, as if it was a cricket match. The paymaster and I, and the petty officer Murphy, and so on. We had a grandstand view of it. It all happened right under our eyes. At 11.25 a.m., Spicer and his fleet set off in pursuit of the enemy. Spicer is in the Mimi. And Lieutenant Dudley, without his bicycle, is at the helm of the tutu. Spicer's plan is to sneak in behind the Kingani and attack her from both sides. The Kingani can only fire on them with her bow guns. Capitan Zimmer has sent the Kingani to blow up the Belgian harbor installation, but instead is confronted by Spicer's entire navy. She was well inside the bay before she was aware of the existence of the British boats on the lake. And the Mimi and the Tutu rapidly overhauled her and opened fire. Waterhouse! Just raised to 200 yards! Fire! An early shot from one of our guns carried away her mast, and she got several hits below the waterline. In the ensuing half hour, 11 enemy sailors are rounded up. Lieutenant Dudley takes control of the captured Kingani and brings her and the captured survivors back to base. At Calame, Spicer is showered with sand, a traditional gesture that confirms his mastery of the earth he stands on. Three German sailors are buried with military dignity. 
the British have suffered no casualties. But the battle for the blue heart of Africa has barely begun. In London, he was ignored, but at Lake Tanganyika, Geoffrey Spicer is hailed as a hero for his brilliant ambush of the Kingani. He must now repair his damaged prize. British and Belgian engineers patch up the Kingani's 11 holes and refit her with a larger 12-pounder gun. When they are finished, Spicer rechristens the German gunboat as if she were a French poodle, naming her HMS Fifi. With a bolstered sense of confidence, Spicer's behavior becomes more outrageous, more bizarre. Twice a week, he performs a ceremonial public bath, complete with cigarettes and vermouth. His body is decorated with symbolic tattoos. Spicer's men suspect he has gone mad. But the Baholo Holo warriors understand the white man's message. They call him Buana Chifungatumbo, Lord of the Loincloth. February 8, 1916. We got information from native spies that the Kingani had been sunk by a new coastal artillery battery. I decided to check into this myself and sent along the Godson, the Hedwig von Wismann, and the smaller boat. The Germans still do not know the Royal Navy has invaded the lake. The Hedwig von Wismann was to get to the Belgian coast in the early morning and inquire about the position from friendly spies, then head back to Cape Congui, where she would meet with the Gutsen at around noon on February 9th. Then together, Zimmer and Odebrecht will attack the harbor. At dawn on February 9, the dance begins, with control of Central Africa at stake. It is a humid, hazy morning. Distant vessels shimmer like mirages in the heat. Through the haze, Spicer spots the Germans. Spicer leads the attack in his new flagship, the Fifi. Chief Engineer Wainwright takes the speedier, more maneuverable Mimi. The weather conditions made the estimation of the distance very difficult. And until the enemy closed to within 5,000 yards, he appeared to be a dark blob suspended above the horizon. For more than an hour, Spicer's shells fall short of the fleeing German ship. But the Mimi cuts off her escape and forces the Germans to turn and fight. As if protected from death by his magic tattoos, the Lord of the Loincloth refuses to take cover. Fire! 
The Battle of Lake Tanganyika lasts 90 furious minutes. Hemmed in by Wainwright and the Mimi, Spicer's cannon blasts a fatal wound in the Wiesmann's engine room. In a few minutes, the Hedwig von Wismann burst into flames, and finally she upended and went down. From among the wreckage, Spicer retrieves the German battle flag. The first enemy banner captured in combat anywhere in the most deadly war in human history. 21 Germans survive the explosion. Seven others are killed. Again, there is not a single British casualty. Now only one target remains, the Gotsam, the mightiest of all warships on this deadly inland sea. To the Baholoholo people, the sinking of the Wiesmann confirms Geoffrey Spicer's status as an indestructible warrior. A man whose magic places him in the realm of the gods. For miles, up and down the lake, elaborate clay fetishes are shaped in Spicer's image. And clay and wood images grew up all around the place. The helmet and the beard and the jupe and the bare arms with scratches on it to make the tattooing. He was the great Buana Ikuba. At the peak of his powers, Spicer is told that his war against Zimmer is over. The Allies will import a new weapon, airplanes, to destroy the Gotsen from the sky. June 1916. Allied seaplanes launch a barrage of bombings on Kigoma. Zimmer decides to scuttle his flagship. It was hard for us to blow up our last ships, but they could not be allowed to fall into enemy hands, for they would have construed it as a kind of victory. We conceded to the stronger force, but our willingness to serve and our enthusiasm was not broken. Germany's dreams of an African empire are shattered, thwarted by an unlikely hero and his jungle navy. After almost another year of protecting the lake, Spicer and his men are ordered back to England. His warships left behind. The British Naval Africa Expedition is a total success. Its military objective attained. Its men back home unharmed. He has led his men on a bizarre, nearly impossible mission, a small step on the long road to history. He is awarded the Distinguished Service Order, and 15 others, including Henschel, Wainwright, and Dudley, are also honored. After the awards and the ceremonies, the Lord of the Loincloth returns to the same desk he left in 1915. As a warrior, his duty is done. The expedition was the smallest ever sent out, there being only 28 men all told. And it was the only expedition that had come back without a single casualty. <laughs> 